fantasy war games in the frozen city. Could we know I had fantasy war games on the tropical island? Or fantasy war games in the all-inclusive five-star resort? Ah, wished, Dougal. Just think of the treasure. Treasure? What treasure? We haven't found any. Aye, but we will. The place is riddled with it. Apparently. Apparently? Aye. If that was true, you'd think we'd have bumped into at least one other warband. All I've seen since we've got here is ruins and snow. There's another warband down there in the plaza right now. No, oh, aye. Still, that's the first one we've seen. Hang on, is that Derek the Spectacular? Derek the Spectacular? It is. What's he doing here? Well, same as us, I'm guessing. The place is riddled with treasure, remember? Who is he, anyway? Who is he? He's nothing more than a jumped-up kid's birthday party magician masquerading as some sort of mage, that's who. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'll pelt him with a snowball. Give us a wee laugh. No, 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 don't. He's actually quite handy with that stuff. Use it to light candles, does he? Tell you what, though. Some of his followers look familiar. Aye, they would. They were part of our warband until this afternoon. Right enough. Leon... Where is our warband? Down there, with Derek the Spectacular. So they're now his warband? Looks that way. But why? Why did they leave us? Ah, I, I, um... I think they were a wee bit upset with my necromancy. Your necromancy? (laughs) But you're not a necromancer. Yes, I am. (laughs) No, you're not. Leon, I've never seen you animate so much as a mouse skeleton before. And therein lies the problem, I'm afraid, Dougal. Neither had they. I promised them we'd be well backed up on this expedition. So what happened? Well, I couldn't manage. Used to be able to do it, no problem. Raising a stiff like. But it gets more difficult the older you get. You know how it is. (laughs) Well, I suppose there is still one magic trick that you're good at. Really? What's that then? Make me disappear. I'm away to join Derek's warband. See if he needs an extra pair of hands for Polish knowledge treasure. I'll maybe see you later. Well, welcome back to the... I could never remember the name of the podcast, but welcome back to anyway, Joe. Yeah, that's good to be back. Is it good to be on a podcast where the host doesn't know the name of it? Is that is that unnerving <laughs> or is it just pretty cool? Nah, it's all right. <laughs> Do you ever forget the names of any of your games? That'd be impossible, wouldn't it? Um, no, I forget the rules plenty, or I forget which <laughs> rules apply to which games. But <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think it was. Um, it must have been two or three months ago we last spoke. So in that time, Joe, what's what's new with you? So I, w- I went. I went home to the U.S., which was a, a pretty big deal over Christmas. Mm. So it's first, first time I've been been back to the U.S. in three years, and see my parents and you know it was both a wonderful experience for for seeing everybody but also quite stressful because it was right in the face of of all the restrictions and we had to take millions of covid tests and Mm. just worry that anybody testing positive is going to leave you stranded somewhere but it all worked out so you ever going to implement a roll table for COVID in any of your games? Like, you know, the, the ranger, he's about to do a thing, but then he takes a lateral flow test and he has to isolate for two turns. It's fantasy, man. We're supposed to enjoy being in a different world. So. <laughs> yeah, the, the diseases are much worse. In the exactly. Games. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've been. Well, this is playing... terrible, but at least it's fictional. Yeah. <laughs> I've been playing a bit of Rangers, really enjoying it. Um, really immersed yeah. myself in it the last um, couple of months, I think. Um, just uh, pouring through the book and stuff like that. It's funny with games as well. Like I know it's a solo game, so you literally just could play it every day if you wanted. But yeah. it's the sheer volume of like um, diving into a game and reading the books and stuff compared to the time you actually get playing it, uh, maybe <laughs> just me, but they're, they're very, very different um, ratios, if you like. But I, I really enjoy it. I really enjoy pouring through that book. It's it's great. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of different aspects of this hobby and we, we sometimes get stuck in this idea that we have to devote most of our time to to any one aspect and and generally that's playing oh i i I haven't played enough but you know if if you're getting the fun from 
reading books or, or painting minis or crafting terrain. You know, it's fun to to concentrate on those either for a time or, you know, all the time. It's finding what you love to do the most. And, yeah, it's the, it's the build-up I like. You know, I, I know that yeah. there's a game in, say, three weeks, and I've got a target of, you know, I need to get these spiders finished, I need to get some of these zombies done. Um, what do I need? You know, I'll start writing my list so that on the day I don't forget anything. So it's, <laughs> it's just the build-up. Um, and then yeah. re- reading and rereading, no matter how many times I read a book, when it comes to rolling the first dice, I'm like, oh, wait, wait, how does that all work again? Like, I have to go back. Yeah. It's almost like I forgot everything, so... <laughs> Um, I was looking at, again, it will take me a long time to work through the book, but I was looking at some of the expansions. So, um, yeah. and do you call them expansions? Is that the best word for it? I don't know. Um, probably not. Uh, for the most part, they're kind of adventures. You mm, know, they're more yeah. like, like getting a and d Well, I guess they called them what, modules or something. But it's it's, you know, most of them are really about here is the next adventure you can go on here's the next part of the story Mm -hmm. some some of them have bits of rules that you can add to the game but i wouldn't call them expansions in the way most war games kind of think of it yeah like here's a new box with loads of new minis in the book and it's it's 80 quid yeah (laughs) (laughs) Um, it's not that (laughs) the uh have have you got a particular um favorite additional adventure that you that you recommend me getting after i finish this book um probably my favorite is, is you're you're in luck is the smallest and cheapest so <laughs> which was called uh blood moon which was was actually the first one i wrote for the game and yeah the werewolf one yeah and it's just the single adventure that's you know a single scenario that's all there is mm. in there but but i wrote it because i i just really wanted to see if i could do something that was a little bit more like a, a murder mystery in, in a war game, mm. um, you know, and one can argue about how, how much I succeeded in that, but, but I think it's certainly a very different type of scenario. You know, you've got a, a cast of characters, a cast of suspects who are, who are on your side for, for most of it, but you know, at any point, one of them could pop into a werewolf. And at the same time, you're looking for another werewolf. So it's just kind of, a very different a different experience i think of gaming so and i'm just kind of quite proud of that idea and how it how it came out so. are there any gnolls in it <laughs> then i don't think so there's there's some wolves there's giant flies uh and werewolves with the kind of opening adventures in the main book and stuff like that what made you opt for the knoll the humble knoll because he doesn't get a lot of play <laughs> does he no, he doesn't. I mean, I guess it's two things. One, I didn't want to use orcs because, you know, everybody uses orcs. And mm. there's, there's already enough kind of of the setting drawn from Tolkien that I didn't want to just kind of like, you know, hey, it's Mordor and here's the orcs. Yeah. Um, so I wanted something different. But but essentially, you still want your kind of basic bad guy foot troops. Um, and luckily, the North Star had put out a box of, of gnolls to go with Frostgrave years a few years before and i thought well there's i know people can get these that they're not expensive um and it it just gives a different a little different flavor to it they're they're a little i don't know a little more bestial Mm -hmm. and um, it's good as well for like i mean i i don't have any nose miniatures wise but it's great like, <laughs> like i've got goblin archers so they're fine as null archers um exactly. chaos warriors they'll do as nose it's just like you're saying you're your your man sized or man shaped bad guy with two legs sort of thing um, <laughs> so a nolo a nolo work um exactly and i think also people because it is a slightly odd one people are actually a little bit more likely to proxy mm. Whereas if I said orcs, people would think oh, I got to go out and get some orcs. Yeah, you know? can't can't because, spot the orcs. orcs are easy to get. Yeah, yeah. But if you say gnolls, people are like, I don't have any gnolls, and and some people were like, All right, opportunity to get gnolls, and others yeah. would be like, eh, I won't worry about it. I'll use orcs. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I've noticed with the scenarios, so a mixture of outdoor and indoor scenarios, was that a conscious thing for you? Did you did you? Were you deliberately like wanting to do some stuff inside just to keep it mixed up a bit? Yeah. Well, I mean, 
because I've tried to think about the game more as a role playing game in the sense of like what would happen in a role playing game. Um, you know, what would happen in a classic Dungeons and Dragons campaign? And and in that you would you would have outside and indoor scenarios. So I wanted to kind of mimic that and and really just to have the freedom to 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 write any kind of scenario and not worry about it too much. You know, just let's see where this idea takes me. And um the game I've mentioned it on an episode before, like it seems to lend itself really well to a bit of homebrewing, if that's the right term. Have you yeah. come across a lot of people writing their own scenarios and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, in the it's mostly seen in the Facebook group, but there's a huge load of files in there uh, that people have written their own scenarios. And um, I even uh, last year asked a few of them to to contribute to a little fanzine I did. I, I don't know. <laughs> I call it a fanzine, but of course I put it out, so I don't know if it counts as a fanzine. But there's, <laughs> there's a book called Star of Alador, which collects um, some scenarios written by fans that I edited and put out um, kind of just as a bit of fun. And as a thank you to, to some of the fans that have done a lot of good work and um, you know, it's, it's probably not something I'll continue because it's a lot of work for me, but, but it was fun. And it, and it just highlights how much creativity there already is in the community. And so, yeah, even if, even if you never bought another scenario after the main book, there's, there's plenty you could go out and find written by other people. Where can you get that? Is it uh, the, the or fanzine or official zine or whatever you want to call it? Is it still available? <laughs> yeah, you can get it. You can get it on Drive Through RPG in either PDF or or print on demand. Mm. Same as you can get all the the supplements. Yeah, expansion, whatever they are. <laughs> so. Cool. I'll dig that out and put it in the show notes. Yeah, because um, what I need is more scenarios that will take me more years to play. <laughs> I just I just like to read through them and imagine that you know when I'm fifty I'll be maybe on this one. So uh, how's well, um, you know, I mean, I'm kind of the same way with with role playing games. Like I very rarely role play these days, but, mm-hmm. uh, but I love to read role playing adventures because I think you get some of that thrill of playing through it j- just by reading it, and mm. and it stirs your own imagination, and you can put your own characters in there, and you know gives you ideas for other things. So. What's the state of play with Silver Bayonet then now? <laughs> uh, going strong. Um, it it hasn't been officially announced, but I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you that I have agreed to do two small uh, supplements for it. Um, mm-hmm. Kind of half size of what I do for Frostgrave. Um, I'll be honest, originally I had no particular intention of doing any more material for it. Um but the, the response to the game was just kind of so overwhelming. And, um, and Osprey wanted me to do it. And, um, you know, and I, if, if people are enjoying the game that much, I want to give them more, more stuff to, to play with. So, but I'm getting pretty limited in my time with all these different systems. So I said, I, I can do it, but I need to make them a bit shorter. Yeah. So, Where do you find your audience coming from in that, from that game? Like, is it folks that tend to follow you from game to game or are you, are you maybe pulling in a bit of the, um, maybe historical gamers or that that haven't maybe checked your stuff out before. Yeah, I think I think probably the majority are people who are already fans of my games. But I think perhaps more than anyone previous, it has picked up a new kind of subset, which is the the historical gamer, or the more casual fantasy gamer, um, who's kind of been looking for for an excuse to to try one of those types of games but didn't want to kind of go all the way to to Frostgrave or you know Mordheim or whatever you know <laughs> something with a little more connection to what they're used to and and perhaps the ability to use the terrain and a lot of the figures they already have before they kind of commit to it you should make one in the future that's just called Knowles versus Romans <laughs> and uh, that everyone could guess what that would be about that'd be quite cool yeah um exactly you got Romans now. Just get some Knowles. <laughs> Rose versus Rose versus Nomans. I've already messed the name <laughs> up, so um, the marketing department will sort that out. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk to you today, Joe, a wee bit about like um, creativity and the writing process and stuff like that. But I have a random okay. question about game rules first. Completely random. Okay. It's been on my mind for a while. And you wrote um, Oathmark, so 
yeah. you you have a rule set that's dealt with something like this. So in my experience, and I mainly that kind of game that I play, it's mainly Kings of War. So yeah. archers can right. fire at somebody, can fire at somebody if they've got line of sight. But and you might have done this in your game, I don't know. But say I had archers on level ground behind like a rank and file. Um, maybe men at arms unit or something like that. If they can't see yeah. the people coming towards them, presumably they can't shoot at them. But when you see like um, Lord of the Rings or films or programs like that, the, the archers will just shoot over their heads and kind of judge the distance. So can you do yeah. that in many games like that? Um, yeah, most most games have some sort of kind of volley fire rule where it's kind of yeah, essentially indirect fire. Um, and you can fire over a unit generally, um, but with a penalty, you know, you're not, you're not as good. Mm-hmm. At mm-hmm. As. Yeah. And I mean, and, and that, you know, cause that is also fitting with history, you know, that, that did happen a lot. Although generally you'd want, yeah, your archer sitting on a slightly higher elevation, but I mean, one of the things that like history and war games, they, they tend to have a hard time replicating is of course, you know, in a lot of battles, your your archers would stand out front for a while and shoot, and then just kind of retreat behind the other guys when when the enemy got close. Yeah, and that's the pub. That tends to be a bit hard to do with a lot of war games, just because of the way movement rules work. And um, so, but yeah, most most games do allow it to to some extent. At any rate, imagine um, being a, a medieval archer and. Uh, like Holland or Belgium, because I, I don't think I've ever seen a hill in the countries when I've been there. It's just flat. Like, yeah, <laughs> never, get, never get any advantage there. Um, cool. I know that that was just a weird question that I'd been thinking about for a while. Because if I'm setting up, I'm like, need to get the archers at the front, but then I'm like, but would they really be there? But yeah, like you're saying, d- do a bit of shuffling when the yeah, and I mean, you also get you'll get a lot of them. Sticking up stakes in front of them. <laughs> yeah, aye, that's yeah. true. Or pets so the or cavalry something. can't charge them down or not as easily. So. Cool. Yes, question answered. Um, so that's good. Penalties. That's the that's the answer. I suppose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, aye. So Joe, you you've written a lot of games. Um, the sheer amount of work that must go into these projects means that you presumably have some sort of creative process and. Uh, rules if you like in place or good practices in place that you're actually getting stuff done um <laughs> is that an ongoing battle with you do you find um uh, yeah it's it's um i've gotten pretty good at it but i do go through periods of kind of lethargy where it's more of a struggle but um but generally the the fear drives you you know if if i'm not working i'm i'm not going to get paid i'm not going to eat so um it does tend to uh, get you get you motivated so how it begins for me is i send the kids off to school and um the wife goes out to do whatever she's doing for the day and generally i immediately start writing but it, it's a bit circular cuz actually i should say like it I guess my, my writing tends to begin the day before. So after lunch, I, I tend to go for a bike ride. And and during that bike ride, I'm mainly thinking about what am I going to write tomorrow? You know, if that's a scenario, start constructing that scenario in my head. What pieces am I going to use? What kind of monsters are going to be in it? And um, even to the point of like, you know, if, if it's more narrative, what's, what's my first sentence? What am I going to write? And that way when I come to the desk tomorrow, the next day in the morning after the kids have gone to school, I already have a very clear idea of what's the thing I'm going to write today. Um, You know, and I may or may not be successful at it. Uh, You know, the more I've done it, the more success I have at that. But, you know, because I may hit snags or figure out actually I missed something or something doesn't quite work. But, But generally, even then, what I'll try to do is just power through it and write, you know, I write that scenario as best I can in the morning. Um, because while it's different for everybody, my, my kind of peak creative, not creative, but my peak, uh, industrious time, I guess, is pretty much from about eight in the morning till about 11. And, um, 
after that, I, I start to fade. Um, and so from about 11, I do, you know, admin or whatever. Um, and then I have lunch and then I go on that bike ride and then I'll come back and depending on what, what is going on, I'll either do some more admin or I'll play test something, you know, I'll set it up on the dining room table. And, and generally when I say play test, I'm not talking about playing a full game. Uh, I'll have very specific questions that I want to answer. So I'll set up maybe a game in progress or a game right at the start and just play a couple of turns just to see what happens. Cause you know, when, when you've been dealing with the same game system for a long time, you can, you can play a lot of things out in your head, but there are, whenever you're introducing new elements, you'll need to sometimes see that. So, so I'll do that. So, but yeah, the two key things are really that kind of creative time the day before and then the really blocking out, you know, no distractions, a couple hours of, of solid writing. Um, you know, and that's that's during the when I'm actually writing. Some days the writing gets replaced with with editing or, you know, proofreading or the more boring stuff. <laughs> but yeah, it's it, it's really interesting. You talk about the, the bike ride and stuff and, and kind of knowing what you're going to be doing the next morning and i always like that you know i'm somebody who i work writing these days myself um yeah. i like that hemingway quote about uh or hemingway advice where he said about finish mid-sentence the day before because right you know exactly you know when how you're going to uh, start the next day um yeah. I've, I've also uh, kind of likened that to paint the miniature you know you might um, be tempted just to finish a wee bit that you know needs done I'm not talking about painting half a cape and leaving the rest, but you know, <laughs> maybe you know that this sword's going to get done next. I think it's quite a nice thing to do to just say, okay, that, well, that's an easy starting point tomorrow. And once I do that, yeah. I'll be kind of into the flow and I'll, I'll get on with it. Um, so I like I like that Hemingway quote, but one I also like, um, and I was guilty of this years ago. Um, I can't remember who the quote's from. I think it was an artist, but talked about writer's block and inspiration being for amateurs because a lot of <laughs> A lot of aspiring writers think, you know, I would sit down and write, but I'm just not inspired just now. And there's a lot to be said for for just sitting down. And you know, the first twenty minutes are going to be pretty difficult, but it's your job and it needs done. So it works hard yeah. sometimes. So you just need to crack on, don't you? Yeah, somebody's got a quote that it's like, yeah, ten percent inspiration and ninety percent perspiration. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You may need an idea, but if you don't sit there and do the work, it's all useless. Yeah. So. And then I think I think like you're saying as well, getting out on the bike. Um, for me, it's walking, and I think that's really important too because you're you need to step away and formulate your ideas and and sort things out in your head whilst doing something rote like walking. Yeah. Um. So when you go out on the bike, presumably you're not sticking a podcast or music in. Are you just um <laughs> just being alone no. with your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, and and you know, and generally I'm talking about kind of the same route or a familiar route every day. You know, I'll, I'll do, I also like to go out exploring on the bike, but that's, that's a different thing. This is the both exercise and yeah, mental kind of work. So, and yeah, there is definitely a connection between the physical and the mental. Yeah. That's why people talk about the, the shower moment, you know, they're in the shower mm -hmm. and it's, it's things that their subconscious has been working away on for a long time possibly and it's just clicked yeah. it? nobody knows how it happens but it, it, it obviously is a thing um how do you document new ideas do you have do you keep like a wee notebook on you or anything like that or do you just have a good memory you know it's funny like i i buy notebooks compulsively i just i absolutely love notebooks um and i never write anything in them because <laughs> well i do like i write the i write the first page in all of them and then i i quit because the truth is i just I very rarely forget the the ideas, you know, I just, and especially these days, cause, because I'm here every day working on things, you know, I tend to use ideas pretty quickly. Um, but, but even if I don't, then I, I just, I don't know. I just tend not to forget them. So I'll, I'll occasionally write something down, but I don't know. I just <laughs> mentally log it and, uh, 
Yeah, somebody once said to me years ago, don't worry about writing your ideas down because if they're good enough, they'll stick with you. And that worked for a few years. (laughs) And I remember I came up with this great idea. And the next day, I think I'd had a few beers. Probably wasn't a great idea. But the next day, I was like, (laughs) I cannot for the life of me remember that. And I never have since. So um, so now I'm a fan of uh, jotting, (laughs) even if it's just a bit of shorthand, which I can't write. So I don't know what the sense of that would be. But um, yeah, documentation of ideas. when you come to the writing process, when you're sitting down to do some writing, is there a clear distinction between I'm doing some lore, I'm doing some stories, or I'm doing you know hard rules here and tables and stuff like that? Nope, not for me. Um, I, you know, I think for a lot of people it probably is because you know I, I've I have discovered that writing fiction and and writing nonfiction be that rules or whatever. They are different skill sets. Um, But I've now practiced both of them so much. I feel kind of equally competent in both. And I, and I feel pretty confident switching from one to the other uh, pretty quickly. So yeah, like with a scenario, because most of my scenarios will start with a little narrative block, you know, Um, it's pretty minor, but, but I write that and then I go straight into the rules for that scenario and just because i i like to to write in order as much as i can um at least in in that kind of flow sense um if i'm writing a book i'll I'll break the chapters into different parts and perhaps write different parts of different chapters at different times but but generally within a chapter it's start at the beginning and right through to the end and add whatever's necessary next even if that is yeah stop and do a you know 50 entry table I'll just start doing the table and those, those are those tend to be hard days when you're just kind of stealing steering it steering staring at the ceiling going all right what's number 17 you know like but, um, do you um do you do a monday to friday do you try and keep weekends free or how does that sort of work yeah uh yeah i'm very much on a kind of classic work schedule now um I'm not, I mean, I'm not afraid to take advantage of the fact that I'm not in an office and, you know, if, if there's a reason to take a day off, I'll take a day off. But, but I like, the thing is, you know, with, with a family, no one's here Monday to Friday. So it's a great time to work. And then of course, everybody's around on the weekend. So it's both a terrible time to work and a great time not to work. Um, you know, so it's just easier to, to get it done. <laughs> The, the house obviously being empty is a bonus, but how do you deal with other distractions? Are you pretty good with keeping a phone away from you so that you're not tempted just to find yourself looking at the internet when you should be writing or anything like that? Well, I mean, I'm on a computer anyway, so... <laughs> Aye, true, true. My phone's not a big distraction. Um, it depends. It, it depends what I'm writing. So, like, if I am writing that table of 20 entries i do often stop and and check the internet just because it's it's such a kind of boring way to write you know one sentence then think of something else then one sentence think of something else uh but if it's it's more flowing then then i just get into it and i don't worry you know i I don't even think about wanting to do other things and and i tend to get annoyed if if other things crap if the phone rings or you know the postman comes or, or whatever but i mean i do have my i do have my days where like you know, oh, I just don't really want to write this today or it's going really poorly. And yeah, it, it does break down occasionally. So, <laughs> Have you ever, for all the fiction you've wrote, have you ever done a novel or anything like that? No, I've written some, I guess what you'd call novellas or novelettes or, you know, kind of 20, 30,000 word pieces, but I've never, never done a novel. Uh, I've just never quite felt like I had an idea that would justify a novel. Um, now I think about that and go, you know, no one does. You've got to have lots of ideas that that end up justifying a novel and you probably won't discover all those until you start actually working on it. Um, so if I were to do a novel, which I might one day, I think I'd take a very different approach than back when I was writing more fiction, actually, when I was mainly writing short stories. Um, but in in the fantasy form, in many ways, I actually prefer the the short story as a form, although it's a pretty much impossible way to to make a living. Yeah, I think um, 
the benefits of like it's I, I suppose it's like TV series as well, like ongoing TV series when the the viewer or the reader or whatever they buy into a character and they're with them for the long term. And when you're, yeah. I think that's I'm not I'm not so much into films because it could be done in an hour and a half. You know, I've just met the character; they might be mm-hmm. dead, they might be dead in an hour, um, even if they're the hero. So I think that's why I like kind of ongoing fiction, right? Well, I mean, I guess I, I grew up on like um, kind of like a lot of sword and sorcery and well, short stories in which you had uh, ongoing characters. So like all the Sherlock Holmes stories and the Conan stories and, and Fafford and the Grey Mouser. And so I really enjoyed those where you kind of have these series of short stories, but but each one's contained. Um, maybe it's just because, you know, I didn't read as much as a kid, so a short story was, you know, manageable, whereas a novel was just too much. But uh, do you read a lot now? Oh yeah, I basically that's that's my default state. If if I'm not working and there's nothing else I have to be doing, I'm probably reading. Um, what sort of stuff have you been reading recently? Um, man, I to be honest, I, I read almost everything, any anything you put in front of me. I mean, I guess. Fantasy science fiction is my favorite, but I read a lot of history. I read a lot of historical fiction. I read, uh, I read books on philosophy, science, uh, self help. Uh, just I just finished a, a big book on the history of the library as a as a concept, which was actually really good. <laughs> so, do you do yeah. do you do audio books, paper, Kindle, or do you just do them all? Paper, always paper. It's, it's always paper. I mean, I, I will, I will read an ebook only if there's just no other way to get it. Hmm. Um, well, and and I always keep one on my phone just if I'm absolutely desperate, you know, <laughs> hmm. if I'm stuck somewhere. But um, why paper? Is it just having that tangible sort of book in your hand? A couple of things. One, I get so much screen time already since I'm sitting in front of a computer most days, hmm. or at least you know, a good half the day or more. Um, so I just, I just don't need the additional screen time. Um, but I, yeah, there's, there's something about the physical tactile nature of it. There's something about my brain functions better at remembering things when I can remember the point, the approximate point it was in a book. Mm -hmm. So you know, I tend to remember, well, that was about a hundred pages in, you know, and I don't know. It, it just changes when I do ebook. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to stick quite as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. They're harder to go back. It's, a nonfiction ebook is very hard to, there might have been a good bit that you want to go and look at again, but it's very hard to find it. Um, yeah. And I like the fact that physical books are a they're almost a prop, you know, they remind you that they're there. Whereas the ebook, you need to go to the Kindle, put the Kindle on, find the book. Yeah. Um, so the paper book is staring you in the face, shout and read me. <laughs> um, that said, you know, as, as my eyes get worse, I could see myself going over to Kindle as I got older. And, you know, cause that, that ability to increase the font size is, is pretty good. <laughs> so you just need those very, very thick glasses, the milk bottle. Well, they're, bottle. They're, they're getting slightly thicker every year now. So. <laughs> Do you never, uh, never fancy audiobooks then? Never do that? I've tried. You know, I, I really used to enjoy listening to audio drama, um, and I still do occasionally. So I've got it. For I've, for years, I've listened to the, um, like, Doctor Who audio dramas. I don't know. If, this kind of company called Big Finish, which has the rights to do Doctor Who stories with all the, like, previous doctors. Um, and I've just really enjoyed I think they've actually done a better job carrying on the legacy of Doctor Who than, than the TV show has. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess that's the, so I used to do listen to those a lot while painting. Um, and I still do from, from time to time. It's, it's quite expensive. Um, you know, they are quite expensive, you know, when you think they tend to cost, you know, 15 quid and they, you get an hour and a half out of that, mm-hmm. you know, it's not, not the greatest entertainment investment, but, but the, but they're really good, and I mean their their production values are extremely high, and um, so yeah, I, I do that, and I'll, uh, you know, I listen to the, a very occasional ebook, 
usually kind of like, you know, a BBC four something that, that I can get online. Um, but I don't, I just rather read most books mm. when you get right down to it. So what about uh, TV and film? Do you, do you watch any TV shows or anything like that in the evenings? Yeah. Uh, not as much as I used to. Um, my wife and I just finished watching season one of the wheel of time. Um, which I haven't read. You know, I liked it. Um, I wouldn't say it's amazing. Um, it's a little gory for my tastes, but uh, I worked through it. Um, <laughs> it was better than I expected, uh, but I didn't expect much. So, but you know, there, there's only so much fantasy to choose from. So, I read <laughs> um, the first couple of the books, and then somebody pointed out to me that um, they were like, uh, was it Robert Jordan, I think, wrote them? Yeah, Robert Jordan. So somebody pointed out, they were like, look at how many times he writes about a woman smoothing her skirt. And once somebody had pointed that out to me, I just couldn't, it broken, huh? couldn't unsee it. I was like, well, why do they keep, does nobody own an iron? Um, so <laughs> it was just like, it was obviously his tech with his writing. I'm surprised right. an editor never said, look, Robert, you need to stop. <laughs> she needs to stop smoothing her skirts. Um, but yeah, the TV show they're probably not going to. Not yeah. going to uh, well, you know, now that I think about it, there were definitely a, there a few skirts. skirts in, in, yeah. One one <laughs> one entire episode was just a woman. Exactly, it's character. nothing but different characters. <laughs> it was a very. It's smooth. funny, like I always avoided those books because, like, I just I knew he had no intention of finishing them. Like, yeah. You could just tell the wheel of time was going to roll on as long as he over you. lived, and it did. And then he died, and then they quickly finished it off. You know, <laughs> but is the boy? Uh, is the boy George Martin? Is he still around? I don't really. I, I, I don't look at anything like that. So he could have died, and I wouldn't know. George R. R. Martin. He's yeah. still alive, but I think he's basically gotten so rich that he doesn't he doesn't care too much anymore. Yeah. about writing. Um, he's you know I don't think there's any indication that he's ever going to actually finish his series. And... You ever see, did you ever watch um, the Vikings or the last kingdom? I really liked those recently. Um, I watched the first series of last kingdom uh, on when it was on BBC and I enjoyed it to an extent. Um, I tend to like stories with good guys, essentially like, you know, people you can really root for. And um, you can't, you can kind of sort of root for Uhtred, son of Uhtred, but, but he's not really that nice a guy. And um, Yeah, he was a mixed bag. Kind of, See, I'm the opposite. Yeah. I quite like I quite like a grey area character. Um, right. You know, that you don't really know, you know, what side are they on. I think that's why back in the day I liked Game of Thrones because the whole thing I was just like, are they good, are they bad? And life's not like that, is it? It's, it's in the middle somewhere often. Yeah, but... I don't watch TV for life. So, <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't watch game of Thrones basically for that reason. Yeah. Um, you know, but yeah, not for me. TV is, is escapist. So I want, I want the good guys being good and the bad guys getting their comeuppance, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The feel good stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Do you, are you deliberate about, um, you know, an hour a night TV or anything like that? Cause there's maybe, I don't know, some painting to be done and stuff like that as well. No, um, I, I'm deliberate in the sense of I rarely watch TV to watch TV. You know, I only tend to watch TV because I want to see whatever it is. Mm. Um, yeah, so you you're know. not like a countdown in the background guy. Um, no. <laughs> neighbors with the sound down, uh, but subtitles on. I hate when you see um, that in a pub. I'm like, well, why are you doing that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a... It's the new season of Mandalorian. You know, I'm going to be there on Wednesday when it's released. I'm going to watch it, you know. <laughs> but then I might not watch anything the rest of the week, you know. Like, uh, we're, we're doing Lord of the Rings at the moment, um, treating it almost like a TV series because over the three yes. films, is it something like 12 hours or that? So if you, You're watching the extendeds? Yeah, aye. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it is closer to, to 12. Yeah, so we're just cutting them into sort of hour-long chunks and... Um, that way I'm still getting a wee bit of painting done at night. How much how much <laughs> painting in that do you do you get done these days? Not as much as I used to. Um partly that's because my office is really small and um I can't keep like I have nowhere to keep a permanent kind of paint setup. So 
if I want to paint, I have to kind of put the computer away and, and set it up, which literally takes one minute, you know, but, but it's a kind of mental block. Um, so what I tend to do is I tend to quit working at lunchtime on a Friday and I put the computer away and I set the paints up and then I have a kind of big painting session, not painting session, but I have a painting weekend. So I leave everything up over the weekend and um, usually get a couple of hour or multi-hour chunks in over the weekend. And um, so I probably paint. Well, no, I I ended up painting 161 figures last year because I actually kept track. I think I'm, I'm probably moving a little slower this year, but mm. You know, so I guess by some standards, that's a lot of painting. By other standards, not so much. Um, I'm becoming a lot more deliberate in it. Um, mm-hmm. Painting things because I want to paint them and not worrying too much about their usage in a game. Um, Are you just picking up stuff that you like the look of then? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I, I do a lot of, I put most of my painting on my blog. One thing I don't do though is, so I've bought a lot of Marvel Crisis Protocol figures over the last year. Um, and and I love painting those. And I don't play the game, but I also don't blog about it. And and I've never really talked about it either. And because I that's the one part I want to kind of keep separate from my job, you know. Mm. And for me, it's it's more of, it's not gaming. It's, I guess, kind of model making, you know building a, a little world um because like i said i don't play the game and i don't have any intention of gaming with these these figures so it's just about the act of enjoying painting mm-hmm. but um, so uh, probably about half my painting is that these days and the other half is you know stuff i'm actually using for games do you ever get a game anything then that's not testing something that you're making yourself these days yeah i have to I have to work for it. Um, <laughs> but actually, I've got a couple of friends coming over this weekend. We're going to play some Frostgrave. And um, I got another kind of gaming date in London in a few weeks. Because um, I basically went went a year and a half without playing a thing because mm-hmm. of COVID and, and you know, hunkering down inside even when it was technically allowed. But um, So I'm trying to get back into it a little bit more. Um, what are some of your favorite games? Um, w- without wanting to sound arrogant, it-, it tends to be my own. And that's not because I think they're the greatest games ever, but because I wrote them to be the games I wanted to play, mm. you know, the-, the style of game I wanted to play. You know, they tend to be more laid back, a little bit more random, you know, just kind of just just there for the fun and the wildness of gaming and not too much about the the hardcore rules interpretations and, and winning by, you know, army building or super clever strategy. <laughs> is it is it challenging for you to play somebody else's game and take your work hat off and not start um anal not not saying criticizing, but just analyzing the rules. You know, I see what they've done there and that's quite cool and <laughs> like really digging into Yeah, it is. Um you know, and so I do that to my own games too, but, um, but yeah, with others, you know, things clunk for me now. It's like, oh, that's just not a, a great mechanic or that's not a mechanic that I would put in there because I don't enjoy the way it interacts with, you know, the play, the experience, but um, not always. Obviously, some games are great and <laughs> I don't have that problem, but yeah. Or, or I'm thinking, man, that's a good mechanic. I should, I should figure out a way to steal that, you know? Mm-hmm. But yeah, it is, it is, it is one of the downsides of what I do now is that I can't completely separate my hobby from my job, um, and that's one of the reasons. Like I paint the the, the Marvel figures because it is more separate, um, and it's you know as much as I love what I do, there are days I really miss just being able to use my hobby to completely switch off, um, which I can't really do anymore. Well, like Frostgrave being so famous, have you ever come across anyone who told you about Frostgrave not realizing that you made it? <laughs> um, a bit. I mean, I, at conventions, you know, I'll walk up to a table where they're playing Frostgrave and, you know, they won't immediately recognize me. But that said, like, you know, over 
in, in Britain, I'm, I'm pretty recognizable. Um, I guess I'm pretty recognizable anyway, but, but, you know, I, I, I wear kind of an Abraham Lincoln style beard, which is really uncommon over here. And I tend to wear a baseball cap, which is also uncommon. So when I walk around over here, I tend to get noticed by people who would, who would notice me, but also a t-shirt that says i made Frostgrave." <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know what i'm actually wearing a pat mccann t-shirt right now good with my chaos dwarf on it <laughs> yeah i'll tell dan he, he doesn't listen to this he wouldn't lower himself to listen to my podcast right. well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i listen to this podcast just on repeat it's the only show i listen to exactly <laughs> forget audio books yeah um deep question time what's the what's the last time joe that you changed your mind about something in the hobby um all right i got i got two that kind of i think connect a bit um probably the the big one recently is i thought it would be quite a while before 3d printing had a major impact on the hobby and i was i now believe i was totally wrong and it's already having a major impact and it's going to grow really fast and and by impact, I'm, I'm talking about individuals owning 3D printers. Obviously, they've been used in the, the kind of casting and creating process for a while. But but I just mean the people able to basically print their own miniatures at home. Um, I, I don't have a 3D printer. I don't really have the capacity to have one. Um, and I'm not sure I'd want one even if, if I could. But I've had some things printed out for me by friends and the the quality is is there you know the quality mm. is up to the level or at least near the level of of some of the best stuff out there and that's you know that's improved so much over the last couple of years it's going to continue to improve and the printers are getting cheaper they're getting easier and more and more people are buying them and it, it is starting to have a major effect on the hobby and i don't know what the end game of that is and and luckily since i write rules it's not as pressing a question to me as it perhaps is to, to manufacturers but but it's really interesting to see and like i said I, I was totally wrong about how fast the technology would grow and spread um from what i've heard it's still pretty messy smelly unpleasant to deal with so there's still a ways to go before it's kind of commonplace, but you know, that lure of printing your own miniatures is pretty strong. <laughs> yeah. And like you say, being a rules writer means, you know, that is, that is something that the, the 3d printer is not going to steal, but I wonder, you know, 10 years from now, machine learning rules, maybe this big yeah. computer is just going to be spitting out brilliant games and no humans <laughs> going to be able to compete. So <laughs> just make sure you sell enough um, stuff nowadays exactly. need to retire get, by get it all in now before yeah. it's too late <laughs> yeah um, skynet basically writing rules exactly. before it nukes us <laughs> we're not going to be in the matrix it's just going to write us some really good games so we don't even like come out of our houses <laughs> yeah hi so the machine you're in the matrix i know it's great <laughs> <laughs> this is actually quite good I. Exactly. it's just uh, loads of miniatures being spat out this printer i've got these <laughs> rules coming through nobody to play exactly. with but <laughs> But interestingly, I guess the, the other thing I've kind of recently, I, I don't know if I've changed my mind about it, but it, it's more of a kind of growing sense of like, while I'm attracted to the 3D printer, I'm attracted to the 3D printer because there are now lots of miniatures you can't get without a 3D printer, mm. you know, or that, that are only available through 3D printing. Obviously, you can probably order them through a secondary dealer. What I'm not interested in is the ability to print out a bunch of miniatures um, because I've just gotten to this, this point where I guess when, when you're young and well, when you come back to this hobby, <laughs> as most people do, you know, after college or whatever, I never really left, but most people have the story of going away for college and then coming back and they come back with more money obviously than they had as kids and it's great because they can buy all this stuff and um and i've been there and I've, I've enjoyed that but i'm now getting to the point where it's like actually i really want less stuff um and i want to concentrate and enjoy the stuff i have more 
and I'm discovering that I'm getting distracted by the the amounts. I mean, everybody's got you know the kind of joke and the story about their lead pile or their lead mountain, mm-hmm. and um, and we tend to treat it as a joke. Whereas for me, it's it's actually a problem. It, it it's a distraction, and it's it saps my enjoyment of of the rest of 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 the actual process. So like, occasionally I catch myself and it's like I'm painting this miniature to get it done, mm-hmm. and that's instead of I'm painting this miniature because I'm enjoying it. And that's just absolutely the wrong reason for me to do anything. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just doing it to get it done. Um, And, you know, you might be doing it for a game. So in that sense, you're, you're getting it done, but if you're not enjoying the painting of it, then, you know, either learn to play with unpainted miniatures or, or get a, buy a different figure. (laughs) You can proxy enjoy that. But what else are just like, using the creativity for the figures you've got and you know not i'm not arguing don't buy new minis don't buy new stuff but just kind of being very deliberate about what it is i acquire and why i've acquired it and making sure that i actually get the use out of the things i acquire Mm -hmm. um because you know if nothing else i'll probably have to get rid of it at some point because my house will stuff up which you know i've got a small house happens quickly so but um you know and sometimes i feel a little hypocritical about that because obviously i write rules and every book i have says "Uh, you need these new miniatures but you know as i say of course you don't if if you don't have gnolls you can use orcs and Mm -hmm. only get the gnolls if you actually want some gnolls and you want to paint some gnolls and you want to enjoy some gnolls but um otherwise just just figure out ways to make it work and in the same way you don't have to have the exact terrain I'm talking about here, you know, at the minimum, just get a set of blocks and you can build a house out of that and you can make walls out of that and your, your imagination will fill in the rest and only, only get the nice houses and stuff as you can enjoy working on them. Yeah. And as we've been chatting, I've just been spending 500 quid on new Romans and Knowles for the (laughs) Knowles versus Romans game that Joe's releasing next year. Looking forward to that, Joe. Well, you know, by by the time you paint them all, it'll be out. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> um, as we as we wing round the corner towards the end of our chat, Joe, is there anything you want to mention, point to, promote, um, anything like that? Um, yeah, I guess I will. Uh, so the new volume of Blaster uh, is coming out probably in a week or two, um, and I've got a, a game in there. It's a, it's a full game called Death Ship One, and um, it's kind of an example of, I guess, what I was just talking about. It was kind of my attempt to see if I could write a war game minimalist game. Um, and the the premise of the game is that you control a, it's a solo game, sorry, solo or cooperative. And um, the players control a squad of soldiers that have been essentially pulled out of time and dumped onto an alien death ship. Um, and you can use miniatures from literally any time period. You have to pick whether you're going to do a low tech squad a middle tech squad or a high tech squad. And um, so like, if you want Romans, you get 10 Romans. If you want, you know, modern U S Marines, you get six of those. If you want space Marines, you get four of those, but you can use any of them. Um, There's three types of aliens in the game. And, um, and then all the terrain, well, almost all the terrain is just kind of walls. Um, And so the game is essentially two dimensional, um, but you set up the walls and and they can kind of move around during the game. But, but the whole game is, can you take your squad and get them through all five rooms of the death ship? Um, And the the thought is you probably won't, you'll you'll probably fail. Um, It's a death ship after all, but, but it's a solo game. So you can try multiple times with different squads and, and try different strategies and stuff. So it's so kind of like putting a bunch of Romans on like Space Hulk or that and seeing how they. Yeah, essentially, um, you know, it's not corridors. It's it's kind of big rooms. Mm. Although the, the walls do divide those rooms into kind of sections. But um, but yeah, it's essentially. Yeah. Um, so one of the aliens is kind of alien Gene Steeler-esque. It's, it runs at you and tries to shred you. Um, you know, one of them's a more floaty blob that's just hard to kill. And then there's one that's kind of like. I guess a Dalek that wanders around blasting at random. Um, then you'll encounter those as you go through and roll a lot of dice and, and try to kill them before they kill you and face other kind of traps and stuff. So 
So what's the but game yeah. called again? Sorry, it sounds great. I'm going to have it's to... It's uh, Death Ship 1. Death Ship and, 1. Um, yeah, it's going to be in Blaster Volume 4. So. And where could that be obtained on the old internet? Uh, that'll be on Drive Through RPG. Handy. One stop so. shop. What was I getting there as well? I was getting the fanzine. The, yeah, the Star of Aldor. I mean, that's where you can get all the Rangers supplementary material on there. Again, and you can get it all either PDF or, or print on demand. So between my Romans and Knowles and these books, it's become an expensive conversation this <laughs> afternoon, Joe. <laughs> Here I am telling you. But but you know, you were saying like it's going to take you a while to get through that book. So. Exactly. That's yeah. it. Like, you know, if, if part of what you enjoy about the hobby is reading rules, mm-hmm. then that's fine as long as you're actually reading them and enjoying them. Yeah. Just, you know, don't don't just buy them and stick them on your shelf with the thought that someday I will I will play these. Because one thing I've also discovered is, you know, we, we have this, oh, God, I got to get it now because I, I guess because GW has taught us that they're going to discontinue it and we'll never get it again. But mm-hmm. the truth is that, like, there's always new cool stuff like it never stops so like, you can you can jump in at any point and there's new cool stuff and if you miss the new cool stuff today there's going to be new cool stuff tomorrow so thanks very much for listening to this episode of the tabletop miniature hobby podcast for show notes and links to everything joe mentioned head on over to bedroombattlefields.com and remember you can find our patreon too at bedroombattlefields.com slash worst patreon ever Thanks again, and I'll see you on the next one.